Hello all, um, my name is uh, Oli Funken and on behalf of the Peninsula Parkinson's Research Interest Group or PENPRIC, I'd like to uh, welcome you to this uh, second Meet the Researchers Online Hour. Um, it's the second because you may recall back in May we had uh, Claire Bale of Parkinson's UK to talk to us about why there is no cure for Parkinson's. I'm excited to have Will Young who is a senior lecturer in uh, rehabilitation psychology at Exeter University with us to talk about uh, the topic freezing of gait in Parkinson's, something that um, many of us are faced with every day. Uh, same as uh, Claire, Will was originally scheduled to give this talk at, uh, back in March uh, at the Morse's Arms in Woodbury, but because of uh, COVID-19, we had to cancel that event. I'm very happy that um, Will has agreed to hold this online talk today for us. Um, so we'll be closing the loop on the, uh, the March 25th uh, meeting. Um, so um, there'll be a question and answers after the, um, uh, after the presentation. So uh, where the Penprick team will ask some questions. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Will for his uh, presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, um, Oli and everyone. Um, thank you for the, the invite to come and do this uh, presentation online and I hope to see everyone um, in person at some point soon. Um, before going into the presentation, I'll maybe just give a bit of background about myself. Uh, by training, I'm a psychologist and, uh, and a biomechanist. And most of my research um, actually is not necessarily on Parkinson's, it's on anxiety and the way that this affects the way people think and move when they're walking. So particularly related to fear of falling, how this affects the way people um, visually scan their environment and, and focus on different things. And what we tend to find is that when anxious, people tend to consciously control their movements, uh, which can lead to all sorts of um, uh, different effects in, in, that have implications for fall risk. Um, and it was through this work that I started reading about sensory cueing in Parkinson's and how this can be beneficial um, through helping people allocate attention towards the movement that they want to make. Um, and I just became fascinated in this, uh, in this area of work. And um, I started looking at developing some, uh, some different types of sensory cue that I thought from a psychologist's perspective might actually um, uh, be, uh, be beneficial to many people through creating efficiencies in certain parts of the brain. Um, and I developed a couple of auditory cues for movement and through a, a series of studies um, found that when listening to the sound of actions, like a sound of footsteps on gravel, compared to say listening to a metronome, people who experience freezing can actually walk for longer before they freeze. And I got very excited about these findings and I, I took them to a, a, a series of meetings um, of uh, Parkinson's UK branches and I was presenting these results excitedly. And rightly so, people, um, the, the feedback people gave was, um, well, they said that it was very interesting, um, but a lot of the people who experienced freezing there were saying, well, um, yeah, that's great, but walking for 20% longer before I freeze, that doesn't really help me much in day-to-day -day life. What I really need is something to get me out of the freeze because with this strategy, I'm gonna freeze anyway. And I'm at my most vulnerable when I'm in that freeze and I'm trying to make a step out of it. Um, so it was then that I down tools with every current project that we had running on, um, on forward walking and started focusing entirely on developing strategies to, uh, to help people, hopefully help people initiate stepping from a freeze. And I held a joint meeting of three or four um, Parkinson's branches in West London. And I talked about the work that we've done so far, um, relevant work of other groups, and just asked them, you know, where should we go uh, from here with, with this topic? And a really prominent theme that came from that meeting was absolutely look to find ways of, of helping with step initiation. 
but whatever tools you design, it has to be robust to anxiety. Um, so th those, that was our two, the, the two um, criteria that we had for embarking on the program of work that I'd like to talk to you about today. So looking at what happens when people um, try to make a step from a standing position, what we need to do is shift our weight in a way that frees up the stepping leg. So I know you can't see my feet right now, but if I'm going to step with my right foot, which is on this side, I need to shift my weight over to my left hand side in order to free my right foot up to make a step. And if I don't do that, what happens is I go to make a step and I, I quickly fall back on, on the stepping foot. Um, and because of the way that our nervous system works, what, what can happen in Parkinson's is if you, if you try to make a step and, and fall, fall um, on that foot straight away, that can lead to a, a cyclical sort of reflex process um, of continued weight shifts where you see this rhythmic movement um, in freezing. Um, so this weight shift is referred to by, um, by researchers as an anticipatory postural adjustment. So I started looking at the characteristics of this weight shift and thought, well, what would happen if we just explain to people what this um, anticipatory postural adjustment or APA, what that is, and, um, and see if people, once they understand that they need to make, that it might be useful to make that movement, whether that has an effect. So the, the distinction that I'm making here is that when you ask people what they're thinking about when they're trying to make a step from a freeze, what most people will say, in, in my experience, is they're trying to focus on the, the action of making a step. Whereas what we're talking about here is going, is looking earlier in the process at the preceding weight shift. So I've got a, a video here, I'm not sure if that's working where instead of the bigger block that might represent taking the step, what we're actually doing is looking at a relatively small movement that might be easier to initiate, and hopefully that might create a cascade in our motor system that would culminate in making a step. That's the idea. And we needed to test this in a laboratory to begin with, um, to make sure that people were safe standing in a, in a, in a harness, and another thing that came from these meetings with local Parkinson's branches is that it's no point testing this strategy and potentially showing that it's effective. There's no point doing that unless people are anxious and in a situation that is challenging and representative of the challenges they face in daily life. So what we did was put a virtual reality headset um, on people when they were standing in this harness and the virtual environment they saw was um, was one of several scenes that are commonly associated with worsening fog, uh, freezing symptoms. So this might be a narrow doorway or standing on the landing on top of a set of stairs. Um, whatever the individual participants uh, selected as being something that would um, might represent a sort of freezing hotspot for them. And we used a, a stepping in place task to induce freezing of gait in a stand in a set position so they would be stood on a, a force plate so sort of force measuring platform so we could measure what they were doing when they tried to then make a step forward out from that position and we had um, we had a, a baseline condition or a control where we would induce the freezing and we would ask people to try and make a step using whatever strategy um, they would typically use or none at all, whatever they preferred. And then we had two other conditions, one where people just described the movement of the weight shifting to themselves as a sort of a, a self-talk instruction. So move right, move left and move forward, for example. And the other condition was something that's, um, that's used quite a lot in sports psychology um, to help people cope with performance pressure. And it's known as analogy learning. Um, but what this involves is using a metaphor for movement. So, for example, in basketball, if someone is nervous about making a, a free throw movement, 
a sports psychologist might come along and say, just forget about the, the characteristics of the movement you need to make. Just imagine you're putting your hand up into the cookie jar. And similarly for this weight shifting action, instead of running through this series of instructions for movement, a metaphor for that might be something like just sway like a tree in the breeze. And it is thought that in many situations this can be more efficient in processing information necessary to perform these actions. And the, the, the tree analogy was something that came to mind when writing the proposal for the project. But then I quickly realized that it was a really terrible analogy because the tree is, is rooted to the ground. And what people need to do is, is have a metaphor that actually helps with movement. And the thing that really struck the whole research team in doing this study was the resourcefulness and the creativity that people showed in actually coming up with all sorts of different ideas. Um, and came up with analogies that were particularly meaningful and therefore memorable to them. So for example, someone played a lot of tennis. Um, so they would imagine swaying in anticipation of uh, receiving a tennis serve, and then they would go to make the step. They would imagine that someone served the ball to them and they would step into it. Um, there's all sorts of examples of different um, analogies that people came up with themselves. And that was the, the third condition. So on the, the plot that we have here on the left hand side, this is a sort of bird's eye view of people's balance on our force measuring platform. And in a baseline condition, you can see that the weight shift does not really show a very clear pattern. It's a sort of wiggly line that shows a lot of kind of forwards and backwards movements. Um, forwards and backwards, I had left to right. Whereas with our verbal and our analogy condition, you can clearly see a distinct movement to one side and then forward and this is their weight going to the left so they can step with their right foot although i should say if people wanted to step with their left foot as a preference this would just be a mirror image of that and people were allowed to allowed to do that in the study there were 35 people that took part in the study 17 of those um froze at, at least three times in each condition allowing us to compare um, the success of stepping from a freeze um, in each condition. Um, all but one participant talked about feeling safe with the strategy. There was one participant that did feel con concerned um, about their balance when using the strategy. However, when you look at the ratio of, of successful to unsuccessful steps, so we had a video camera recording um, when people were um, trying to step from a freeze. And the typical way of, of assessing whether someone is successful or not in stepping from a freeze is having a panel of experts who visually evaluate the movements and say, actually, I think that was an attempted step or not. And we went through this process and, and counted the number of unsuccessful and successful steps. And at baseline condition, what we found, and this is fairly typical of what I can see in the, the literature so far, is the success rate is about one to one. So for every successful step people make, there will be a, uh, another unsuccessful step. The, the very stark finding that came from this project was that in either condition where there was, um, that involved weight shifting, the number of unsuccessful steps reduced by about 97%. So this means that in both of those conditions, across the 17 participants that froze, we only had one or two at, um, single trials where people were unsuccessful in stepping from a freeze. In every other attempted step, they were successful. So it seems as though there is, is potential value in, in looking at this further. Um, the, the size of this effect is certainly much bigger than, than I expected and what you tend to see with other strategies that are available. However, I need to talk about some limitations of this of this work because people were stood in a quite a constrained environment. Freezing of gait is is notoriously difficult to induce and measure in a laboratory because typical force plates are quite small; they're about sixty centimeters squared. So actually, getting people to freeze on these plates where you can measure um, the, their behaviour is is incredibly difficult, and you tend to only capture a fraction. You know. Five, 10% of the freezes that occur during the session. 
you only get a fraction of those actually recorded. So you have to constrain movement and therefore these benefits that we see in the previous project, <coughs> excuse me, they're, they're, only, they're only reflective of a fairly simple task, I say simple, a fairly constrained task of forward stepping. Added to which, the training that people received was in person with uh, an expert in, in training these strategies. So in an attempt to try and translate this work to daily life, there are a few more steps that we need to make, um, if you'll excuse the pun. Um, first off, to scale this up, it's necessary to develop the training using videos that people can access remotely and potentially watch again and again uh, to practice the strategy. So this is the first thing we'd like to do. And the next thing is to look at whether this strategy is, is deemed to be safe by users um, and if it's still effective in much more complex walking tasks. For example, if someone is going to walk through the doorway in that virtual environment, turn around and come back, the freeze event could happen at any part of that task. And we need to know if the weight shift strategy is not just effective with the forward walking part. Hopefully people can come up with um, ideas for, for using the strategy as part of a turn. And actually we did a separate pro uh, project looking at training people to, um, to use the cha-cha dance to, to create weight shifting with turning. So um, you can't see my hips, but um, so I won't demonstrate the action. But it seems as though there are, um, there are potential opportunities to incorporate the adaptations to the weight shift training so people can use them and adapt them according to the specific requirement in daily life. And the reason I have this screen up um, showing this, uh, this sort of rather industrial scene, this is a new facility at the University of Exeter called V Simulators. And what this is, is a huge force plate. It's 3.7 meters squared, whereas in our previous study and almost all other previous work, certainly that I know of, we are constrained to these 60 centimeter force plates. So this means that people can walk around this whole area with a virtual reality headset in a mobile harness so they're safe. And what we're planning to do next is rerun this study in these more complex tasks and see if this is still safe and effective. And this is really, um, really quite novel because this, I, to my knowledge, it's the world's largest force plate and, um, and there's really not that much uh, research out there, certainly comparing um, behavior during a freeze between different conditions with strategies. So it's, uh, it's really incredibly exciting um, opportunity to not just look to see whether the strategy is effective, but also look to see just in baseline conditions what behaviors are hallmarks of successful or unsuccessful stepping. And that tells us about sort of underlying processes that, that, um, that influences freeze, um, freeze behavior. The other thing worth considering when taking the findings that we have at the moment and translating them hopefully to daily life is that Daily life is not simple and there's lots of things going on, lots of distractions. And people who experience freezing often talk about anxieties um, related to freezing and how this can be, um, that, how this can make freezing work. There's, there's a lot of um, research literature out there showing a link between anxiety and freezing. So one of the things we wanted to do as part of the previous project, almost as like an added value exercise for Parkinson's UK, is that for all the, the participants that came in, we, we interviewed them about, um, we asked them about their, um, uh, we asked them to give an example of a particularly memorable freezing event or, or sort of common freezing um, events and what they tend to think about when freezing and what makes freezing better or worse. Um, and from those interviews, we had an expert in, in interview analysis who is not an expert in Parkinson's or in the, the psychological literature that, uh, that I tend to work with. Um, so she could look at these interviews and um, hopefully 
be much less biased than I would be in, in interpreting these things. So she would, um, she came up with uh, common themes that people talked about. Um, and we came up with what will initially look like a, a rather complex image, but I will hopefully talk you through this and it won't sound, it won't become, it won't seem complicated for too long, hopefully. So this image on the right hand side is our attempt at summarizing the, the relationship between psychological processes and freeze events as people describe them in this previous study. And the first thing to mention is that there seem to be different levels of freezing as, as a lot of people refer to them. So we have um, this uh, vertical rectangle in the middle um, with the letter A at the top people talked about this continuum between free movement to a deep freeze. And within a given freeze event, it's possible to transition between these, these depth of, of, of freezes. And one of the things that seems to help a lot of people is when they can focus on the intended movement outcome. So this is point B. So the upward arrow, this is when people are able to focus on their movement, a bit like um, in the study, uh, with weight shifting people could focus on on their movements or focus on making a step this seems to be helpful but in contrast many people also refer to what we call de-initiators or rhythm de-initiators these are kind of um, blockers um, that tend to make freezing deeper or worse and a lot of these blockers tended to take the form of distractions um, and most of them were anxiety related. So this might be, uh, for example, in a freeze thinking, why can I not move better? Or I'm wondering, um, I wonder what they must be thinking of me. Um, and what seems to happen there is when people engage in these thoughts, the freeze gets deeper. And then we have this um, circular figure um, halfway up. Um, halfway up the arrow and what seems to happen is that as the freeze gets deeper that then causes people to have a more negative appraisal of what's going on so for example a freeze starts um, it gets deeper because they're thinking um, maybe negative thoughts about you know, um, what people might be thinking of them and then as the freeze gets deeper they then start thinking well oh no the freeze is getting deeper how am I going to get out of it so it, it becomes a vicious cycle. And the, 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 the next part of the analysis is, um, is shown in, in letter D, and this refers to the, the accumulated experiences. Um, this is after the freeze event. And as time progresses following multiple freeze events, um, we have termed this process the the declining self as people talk about a, an, an emerging sense of vulnerability negative self-judgment and um, and a lack of control over the situation and what this seems to uh, what this seems to do is provide a basis for what happens then the next time a freeze might occur so this these are links e and f these big loopy arrows that go up on the left hand side because if people are feeling like they are less able to control a freeze if it happens, then when they're in a situation where they might freeze, they're more likely to be distracted thinking, what, you know, what would happen if I did freeze? I may not be able to step out of it. And all of a sudden you have these distractions which make the freezing worse. Again, this is not, the, not gonna be the case I'm sure for, for everyone, but this, these are just the themes that came out from, um, from this particular study. And I mention this because when we, um, in, in the last study, we called people, uh, we didn't ask them after the study to, to use the strategy in daily life, but we called them on the telephone four weeks afterwards and we, we did some short interviews with them. And about 70% said that they were using the weight shifting strategy at least often. Some of them, were, some people were using it net then every time they froze. Um, and several of those participants referred to these relationships in this in this model and talked about how if they have a strategy that they can rely on 
it may be that that gives them an increased sense of control. And it may be that that then reduces these sort of negative perceptions. It may be that when, um, if they have an increased confidence in their ability to step from a freeze, maybe they're less likely to be distracted by anxiety related thoughts beforehand or during the freeze, which in turn helps them to focus on using the strategy and it breaks this, this, um, this negative cycle. I'm not suggesting that that is the case, um, you know, that the weight shifting strategy is, go is going to be successful in doing that. These are just um, several comments that came from these interviews and it's, it's cer certainly something that we need to investigate more. And I don't think that this method of intervention is going to be limited to the weight shifting strategy. Perhaps there are, um, there are ways that we can um, help um, uh, help people to avoid these distracting thoughts because without them they're much more able to step from a freeze it's actually the anxiety that's that, that's the main problem in in causing this ineff inefficient um sort of psycho psychological processes um so that's where we are at the moment all of those ideas for future research the development of the weight shifting uh, videos uh, the, the training videos, the evaluation of the weight shifting strategy in more complex tasks in fee simulators, um, further analysis of, uh, of these interview data, um, and also uh, another process where we will go to um, participants' homes to uh, freezing hotspots that they select in their homes. What we'd like to do is go to the homes, train them with the weight shifting videos that they would normally use in, in daily life, and then actually measure what effect that has in their ability to step from a freeze where it matters most to them. Those four processes are part of an application that we have going into Parkinson's UK um, any day now. Um, so we are we're hoping for the best with that. Um, but hopefully this gives you an idea of where we're where we're heading at the moment. And, um, and we welcome any comments. And I like to think that this whole program of research is, is kind of initiated and, and, and guided by people who experience freezing. So I'm very keen that people um, give comments so we can, we can make this as useful as possible. So thank you very much. Yes, uh, thanks very much, uh, Will, for a very interesting uh, presentation. I'll now hand over to the uh, panel for questions. Uh, I believe the first one is uh, Nigel. Hello Will, my name is Nigel Coleman, East Devon representative for Penprig. Freezing of gait and gait issues are some of the tip of the iceberg symptoms of Parkinson's disease and although not inevitable I think it plays on the minds of many. Of the 35 people with Parkinson's who assisted in the research, were they all highly affected by freezing of gait? Or if there was a range of people with degrees of freezing of gait, were the stress, stroke, anxiety levels the same across the group? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yes, so everybody in the study reported so they would freeze um, several times every day. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but there was a, a significant range in the levels of anxiety in the group. And it does seem as though there is not a a clear sort of linear relationship between anxiety and and and, and freezing behavior um, and it seems as though based on the interview data and um, one of the things i didn't mention was at the very bottom of the figure one of the accumulated experiences was something that we ended up calling strategies of resilience and it seemed as though some people could be very anxious about freezing but actually they'd come up with different strategies um, and sort of ways of planning their day to help to, um, to overcome that anxiety and provide the sense of um, uh, control over the situation. And what seems to happen there is with the increased sense of control that helps to, helps to reduce the anxiety and then the individual's capabilities to actually step from the freezing comes through. So there, whilst if you, if you increase anxiety experimentally in a laboratory, you see a really clear increase in freezing behavior, but it seems as though uh, the relationship within a given individual is, is not particularly clear. And 
I mentioned earlier about um, people's resourcefulness and creativity, that seems to play an enormously important role in finding ways of overcoming that anxiety. Um, and it's something that really needs to be, to be looked at closer in, in future work. Thank you. It's my turn now, Will. I'm Sue and I'm in the Plymouth area. When you go on YouTube and Facebook, there are umpteen methods to stop you freezing and then free you up. Have you been able to test those on your uh, mega test bed at all? And do you find that your method is more efficient than some of the others? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, so the information I have about our weight shifting strategy is pretty much what I've shown you today. There's all sorts of sort of finer details of that study, but we've not managed to compare that against other strategies. Um, it's something that would be really interesting to look at. Um, but one thing I would mention about the potential for these comparisons is that it would be fairly straightforward to, to compare, say, metronome cueing with using laser beams with you know, a whole category of different strategies um, and compare the effectiveness of, of each of these. But uh, similarly to the answer to the previous question, people have different preferences for you know, different ways of, of dealing with freezing. And what works for one person, we know it doesn't necessarily work for another. And I think what would be really interesting in, by way of a comparison between uh, current queuing strategies um, would be to look not just at the information they provide, but actually what that cue does in terms of helping people allocate attention in certain ways. So whereas our project looked specifically at weight shifting, there are several strategies like walking to a metronome that might actually help to, um, uh, with walking and, and the initiation of gait from a freeze. Um, and part of the way that that, is that that might be effective might be through actually encouraging weight shifting. It's just that it doesn't do that explicitly. So in looking at these different strategies, I think we have to think about what's really going on in terms of what people are focusing on, because it may be that people could listen to a metronome and use that to weight shift, and that might be effective. That doesn't mean that a metronome is more effective or less effective than another strategy. It's really about where the, the focus of attention is. Um, and one of the people that uh, participated in the last study, this wasn't the, the strategy they used within the study, but um, they spoke about afterwards, uh, they called it revving up, where they would sing Nelly the Elephant and they would weight shift in time to Nelly the Elephant. And that was what worked um, best for them. So is it specifically Nelly the Elephant that is a particularly you know, useful strategy? I don't know, maybe, maybe it's the focus on weight shifting. Maybe, maybe there are other mechanisms that we're not appreciating yet. Um, but I think we need to, to look at the nuances there um, because there are probably specific um, psychological processes or the way people are um, allocating attention that is, um, is likely to influence freezing in a big way. And if we can, if we can sort of, identify those then we can target them with the development of strategies but i think the where we should be looking uh, as researchers is to develop a whole repertoire of different strategies that people can select from based on their own preferences well i live near dartmoor in the center of devon um are the findings designed for people of, with freezing of gait as a, is it an emergency tool or should any routine be adopted as a way of maintaining existing levels of mobility or delaying progression prior to the onset of freezing of gait? Because I think that you know, there's two real issues there, which I think are very important. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, the strategy was designed as a so-called rescue strategy. So something that would help people make a step in a given moment to step from a freeze. That's that's what it was designed for and I can't make I can't even make the claim that that's successful I can I can show you the graph and say that in a laboratory in a very constrained task that showed a very clear improvement but we don't know if that's uh, even effective in daily life 
Um, I mentioned with that model from you know that emerged from the interviews that there may be opportunities to use different strategies to help provide a sense of control over freezing, and there may be ways in which having a strategy that people know you know that they work maybe that reduces anxiety. Maybe people are more likely to get engage in in tasks, in engaging activities in daily life that are more meaningful to them, which will have knock-on benefits. But I can't make any claims, or, and I'm even very um, reluctant to suggest that the weight shifting strategy could, you know, deliver benefits in terms of long-term um, changes. Um, but thinking about the potential for that really highlights the need to develop strategies that are effective because the benefits might go beyond just helping people make a step from a freeze. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I had uh, two questions. One a thought just came to me whilst I was uh, watching the presentation. Uh, I'm aware of uh, Terry Gorst in, uh, in Plymouth, a study he's doing with sensory input to balance. Ah. Just wondering uh, if there's any link or overlap with the study that you've been doing. Oh, yes. Um, yes, there could well be. There could well be. Um, the, the act of weight shifting for some people will be particularly challenging because what we're actually asking people to do is put themselves out of balance in order to make a step. Um, so looking more closely at the mechanisms involved in maintaining postural stability um, is going to be really important. Um, so looking at these kind of basic mechanisms of how we maintain balance. Um, and then also looking at sensory input, the way that we use our sensory information to maintain balance is going to be, um, is going to be crucial for this as well. And my first thought there is, is thinking about with the training of the weight shifting, um, in the previous study, we had trainers giving the instructions in person, but we were also able to give feedback in person. So people may receive their instructions and then maybe not weight shift as much as they perhaps should do to successfully unload their foot. So it may be that it's possible to come up with an instrumented way of giving feedback so people um, might know that they are not shifting their weight as much as they might, maybe with some sensor that they could attach to them. Um, and um, the work that's going on in Plymouth would be, um, from what I understand, uh, that might be useful to inform that process of, of how we can sort of augment the sensory information that we, we get. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think the final question I had, and I think you may have touched on that at the, towards the end of your presentation. Would you like any people who are watching this video uh, to join your research or if nothing else get in touch via email to discuss uh, the study with you so yes absolutely i'm really delighted to hear from anyone interested in in this work um, at the moment we're not recruiting for any specific study which means that i'm unable to retain um details contact details for for interested participants but i'm always um looking to um, to to get comments and um and ideas from people um who who may be able to sort of offer insight into into the findings that we're that we're seeing or, or guide future research so i'm really keen to um to engage with uh, with with local branches and individuals um because as i said earlier it's um it, talking about these these findings from these interviews um i can reflect what what people have said in those interviews um, but the more comments we get about the lived experience and what um each of the factors we talk about what that really means um to people in daily life i think that's the heart of what we're trying to to get at in in creating these targeted um interventions so uh, please do get in touch um but i can't hold your details on on file for participation if this upcoming um, or if this current proposal for funding is uh, is successful then i'll certainly be looking to um to engage people in the research um, um either in in the southwest so cornwall devon um somerset as well um so um much of the southwest 
and there'll also be data collections going on in the southeast as well centered around um, Grinnell University um, so if people know people who experience freezing in the southeast as well then there'll be hopefully a data collection going on there as well okay um i think with that we've come to the end of uh, today's um, uh, meet the research online hour i'd like to thank uh, will young again for his time and i, I wish you good luck uh, i'd also like to thank the uh, penprick team uh, the, the the panel who have been putting this uh, event together and for their support today as a, a group of volunteers, we're always looking for others to join us or support us or to give us feedback or suggestions or contributions. So uh, if you do want, if you are interested in helping uh, out in any way, please uh, contact us via Facebook or uh, um, our website. Um, you'll be pleased to hear that we're already working on the our next event uh, for now still in, in online mode but uh, we do hope that at some point in the not too distant future we'll be able to meet researchers face to face again so watch this space thank you and stay safe